Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Zephaniah class. This is class number three today. And uh, today we're going to do the middle chapter of Zephaniah, that is chapter 2, and it's 15 verses long. And chapter 2 is broken down into three parts. The first two verses are talking about what will be happening to Judah in the future uh, and, and to Israel uh, in the long-term future. The third verse is a verse of great hope. It's a verse that will lead us to the rapture, one of the very few verses, or not very few, but one of the several verses we find in the Old Testament that talks about the rapture. And then the uh, uh, fourth through 15th verse is about what God will do to the nations that are opposed to Israel. And, uh, and that's during the tribulation period, but also in some cases, in, a case, in one case, something that will happen in the very near-term future in Zephaniah's time. So that's basically the organization of the chapter. We shift, it's a pretty straightforward chapter. We're going to cover it all today. And let's start by refreshing your memory on a few things from a couple weeks ago. Remember, Zephaniah is writing in 625 BC, give or take a couple of years. He's writing in a country called Judah. Judah, at that point, is just a little tiny outpost in the middle of this gigantic Assyrian Empire, which is this black part up here, is the Assyrian Empire. And Judah's this little thing. And the whole reason Judah's a little tiny outpost in there is because. In 701 BC, Assyria tried to conquer Judah, and Assyria, the Assyrian army was destroyed. And one night, 185,000 soldiers were destroyed by God, with no, no Jews dying in that at all. So the Jews just left Judah alone after that point. It was the only little outpost in the entire gigantic Assyrian empire. And Assyria was the world power of the day back in, in that period. So Judah was the kingdom. The king at that time in 625 B.C. again was King Josiah. This was when Zephaniah was writing. The prophets, there were actually two of them were active at that point. One was Zephaniah, whom we're studying, and the other one is Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was very active at the same time. They were contemporaries. The two of them undoubtedly knew each other. They were very different, though. Zephaniah was of royal blood. He was from the house of, the, of royalty, so he was related to King Josiah. He was a, a great, great grandson of King Hezekiah, one of the great kings of Judah, probably the greatest king of Judah. So he was of royal blood. Jeremiah was much more from the common people. And we're not really getting into a whole lot about, Je about Jeremiah in this class, but bear in mind that these two were preaching and, and prophesizing at the same point here, at this point in 625 BC. So a few years after this, a big war happens. And in this big war, and this war goes from 615 B.C. to 612 B.C., in this war, Assyria, which had ruled the entire, it was the, it was the world power for a couple hundred years, Assyria gets destroyed in this war by Babylon. Now, interestingly enough, these two cities, Nineveh, which is Assyria's capital, and Babylon, which is Babylonia's capital, are only a few miles apart. They're not very far apart. And yet, um, Babylon, Babylon manages to destroy Assyria, destroy their armies, and destroy the city uh, at this point in time. And at the time that this is all being written in 625 BC, we're still at the point where Assyria is the world power. And Assyria is still in control of everything around Judah back then. So everything around Judah is Assyria when Zephaniah is writing this. It will change in a few years. But right now, when Zephaniah is writing this, Assyria is the big power through here. And like everything about you know, the world, you really don't anticipate huge changes that occur in the world. We see that all throughout history. Huge changes can occur, and then people just say, wow, what happened? How did the Soviet Union fall, or whatever? How did that happen? How did those things just happen? Well, it happened at that point. Assyria, everybody assumed, would be there forever, and they weren't. They, just a few years later, they fell. But at the time Zephaniah is writing this, they were the world, the world power. So that's the basic thing I wanted to give you regarding, um, regarding what was happening in the world. Now the other thing I wanted to talk about is, remember as we go through this, something we talked about in our last two classes, Israel and now Judah, because Judah is the remnant of Israel at this point. Judah is the only part of Israel left. All the rest of Israel is gone. There's just this little part around Jerusalem. So Judah is under the covenant of Mount Sinai. 
Now understand that the covenant of Mount Sinai is a national covenant. It was something that God put in place with the Jews at Mount Sinai back in Moses' time. So it's a national covenant. It's a covenant that is a covenant between God and the nation of Israel. It's not an individual covenant. It's not a covenant between an individual and God. It is a covenant between the nation of Israel, now Judah, and God. Now, one of the things we're going to look at as we go through this is we go through verses 1 and 2 here, and we talk about the fact that God is about to destroy the nation of of Judah. That decision's been made. We talked about that a few weeks ago. God has made the decision to destroy the nation of Judah. So, how about the individuals in there? Do they have any way out of this? And the answer is yes. And we'll talk about that today. Individuals are not covered by a national covenant. As individuals, we are covered by God's grace and God's mercy. And a very similar concept existed in the Old Testament to what we know today in the New Testament. We're going to talk about that today as well. So let's get to get going on verse 1. Uh, in verse 1, God tells Judah to gather together, gather together, O shameful nation. Now, gather is a phrase that we saw back in Exodus chapter 19. When God did the original covenant at Mount Sinai, he told them to gather together as a nation. So Israel came together as a nation and agreed to the covenant at Mount Sinai back in Exodus chapter 19. So what God is talking about here is he wants Israel to go back and if, if Israel as a nation, he wants to completely go back and recommit themselves again to this covenant. Well, they really didn't do that here and they would have had to have done that before Josiah's time and they didn't. So the result is it's too late to do that. God is saying, gather together, gather together. They are a shameful nation. They have been in sin. Remember, from the time King Hezekiah died in 697 B.C., all the way down to the time King Josiah came to the throne, which was 640 B.C., for 57 years, they were incredibly sinful. They were every bit as sinful as all their, all their pagan neighbors during that period, during that 57 years. There were... They were worshiping false gods in God's temple, um, and, and it was just a horrible time of godlessness in Judah. So they were a shameful nation during that period. Now, remember, the, the, res the result of that first assembly that God is referencing here when he says gather together was the covenant of Mount Sinai back in Exodus chapter 19. That was the first gathering of the Jews as a nation. Remember, they were listening to God and they couldn't even, they had to put their hands over their ears because he was so loud. They were listening to God, making that covenant with him back in, in Exodus 19. Now, Hebrews in chapter 8 verse 6 uses a different term for this. If you ask a Jew about this covenant, he's going to call it the covenant of Mount Sinai or the covenant of Sinai. That's how a Jew knows this covenant from Exodus 19. As Christians, we pick up the name the Old Covenant. And that's not in the Old Testament at all. The Old Covenant actually comes from the New Testament. It comes from Hebrews 8.6. And the author of Hebrews 8.6 refers to the Old Covenant, which is this covenant, the covenant of Sinai. And then it refers to the new covenant, which is the covenant that Jesus gave us, which is an individual covenant. It's a way for us as individuals to get to God. So, again, this difference that we're getting into and we'll be into today is this difference between a covenant between God and a nation, which is Israel, and the covenant between God and us as an individual. Now, Jesus brought us that covenant when he was here, the new covenant, but there was something similar to that in the Old Testament as well. And if you read through the Old Testament, you'll find it. And I've referenced a bunch of these passages as we, as we go through it in, um, um, in Hosea. You'll see that, that um, seek, if we seek the Lord with all of our heart and mind and soul, he will hear us. He will listen to us. As we look at Deuteronomy, it says, if you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, he will, he will be with you. So there is a way in the Old Testament 
by seeking the Lord with everything you had and loving the Lord with everything you had to get to God. We know there were Old Testament saints. We all expect to see Abraham someday and David and all of those people because they did that. They sought the Lord with all their heart and all their mind and all their strength. So there was an individual covenant even back then, but it was different than the one that Jesus gave us later. Let me move on to verse 2 next. In verse 2, God tells Judah, Before the appointed time arrives, and that day sweeps on like chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you. So Judah is telling, or, or God is telling Judah that they should have called a national assembly like they did at Mount Sinai and recommitted themselves to God, but they didn't. That wasn't what they did. What they did was they continued in their sin for 57 years under King, under king Manasseh and King Amon, and that sin was grievous. God hated it. King Manasseh actually sacrificed his own children to, to the foreign, to the, the pagan gods. And these are things that are just horrible and reprehensible to God. So they didn't do that. Now it's too late. God has made that clear. The nation of Israel is doomed at this point. The nation has lost its chance. The individual, we'll find out in a minute, still has his chance. But the nation has lost its chance. It is too late. Even though Josiah is a good king and he's really trying hard, and he's got these great prophets working with him, it is too late for the nation. They can't come back from what they have done as a nation. There's lessons there for us as nations too, by the way, mm -hmm. for nations in our times. There are le levels beyond which, as individuals, we can always come to God. We can always seek him, and he will, if we can always knock, as Jesus says, and he will answer. But as a nation, there are times when we cross that threshold where we are beyond the point where God will come back and bring us back from that. We need to learn that even today, in our world today, that can happen in our world today. There's some great lessons in the Bible from 2,600 years ago for, for what's happening in our world today. God says that uh, because they didn't do that, they're going to be blown away like chaff. Chaff is like these little strips of paper that just it's blown around by the wind. So God is going to just blow them away like chaff. Uh, and, and then his fierce anger is going to come upon them. And he's talking here for Judah about what's about to happen. In a few years... Judah is about to be destroyed. Now they're assuming it's going to be Assyria that's going to do this, but in reality Assyria is going to lose the war, and the Syri it's actually going to be Babylon, Babylonia, that's going to do this to them. But, uh, um, but that's going to happen. So King Josiah was not able to change the heart of the nation. He tried. He was a good king, but he wasn't able to do it. Now let's move on to verse 3. Verse 3 is one of my favorites. It's, it is my favorite verse here in Zephaniah. God tells Judah, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. Seek the Lord, right? There it is. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. So now we're talking about individuals, right? Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. You who do what he commands, seek righteousness and humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Hmm. So what God is saying here. He's talking about two different times in history. As we've gone through Zephaniah, we've said that there are parts of Zephaniah <coughs> that are talking about what was about to happen in Zephaniah's time. Zephaniah is writing here. By 586 B.C., just 40 years later, Judah is no more. Judah has been destroyed by the Babylonians. So this is about to happen very soon after this is written. It's about to happen to the nation of Israel. And it's about to happen to the Jews in Israel at that point, are the ones that don't choose to go to Babylon. But it also applies to a period that hasn't happened yet. And that's a period of the day of the Lord. Remember, as we've gone through chapter 1, we saw all those references to the day of the Lord, which is coming. And remember, the day of the Lord is one of those Bible-speak kind of terms that whenever you see it in the Old Testament, it's almost always talking about the tribulation, a period that hasn't happened even yet. So the day of the Lord is coming, and here he's talking about that as well. So verse 3 is talking to two times in history. One of them is 586 B.C. when the Babylonians will destroy Judah. 
The other is the seven-year tribulation period that is coming and hasn't happened even yet. It's coming to our world soon, whenever. Revelation uses the word soon to explain when it's coming. So it's coming to our world soon. And uh, it's a time in the future. It's a day when the sins of all the people on earth are going to be judged. And in that time, the earth will be as it is today, 99% Gentile. So the church, or the, 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 uh, the earth will be mostly Gentile at that point. And Daniel told us back in Daniel chapter 9 that this will last for seven years. So this is the same tribulation period that Daniel was talking about. Da Daniel came a little bit after these guys, by the way. Um, these guys were about 625 B.C. Jeremiah was actually around longer than that. He was around into the 580s. But Daniel started at about 605 B.C. and continued on down to about 535 B.C. So Daniel would come up shortly after these people. So let's go through that again a little bit closer up. He's telling the Jews, first of all, that God will judge the nation of Judah. He has already done it. The judgment is done. It will happen in, in Zephaniah's time, and that he will judge the entire world in the day of the Lord, which is in our time to come. At some point to come, he will judge the entire world, which is primarily a Gentile world, as we know. The Jews are a tiny portion of the world today. Now, God offers us a way out here, but, and, and he offers the Jews a way out. The individual Jews still had a way out of this. The nation of Israel was doomed, but the individual Jews still had a way out of this. And the way out of this was, go back to verse 3, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. So be humble, seek the Lord, do what he commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. He says, if you do that, perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. So for an individual Jew who did that, who spent his life seeking the Lord, he was going to be sheltered. God would probably shelter him. Perhaps is in there. Perhaps because it depends on our heart. Do we really seek him with all of our heart? And that's, that's the, the reason the word perhaps is in that sentence. It's up to us in terms of how we seek him. Do we seek him? Do we love him with all of our heart? If we do, then he will shelter us. In those days, he would shelter the Jews. By the way, Jeremiah had the solution. Jeremiah told them, go to Babylon. Jeremiah told the people at that time, leave Israel, go to Babylon. The ones that did were treated very well in Babylon. And 70 years later, their descendants could come back if they wanted to and could enjoy Israel and rebuild the entire nation of Israel. So Ze Ze uh, Jeremiah was giving them the way they could be saved as individuals, which was to seek the Lord and to get out of Dodge before it fell and go to Babylon. So that was, that was one of the things that was being offered there. Now this also, as I said, relates to the period yet to come. If we seek the Lord with all of our heart, as Deuteronomy tells us, as Hosea tells us, as Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah, as Zephaniah tells us here, if we seek the Lord with all of our heart, perhaps we will be sheltered. It depends upon whether we seek him with our proper heart. Now today it's a little easier than that. We just have to, we just have to accept Jesus today. It's a different process, but it's a very similar process. You have to seek Jesus in order to accept him, right? So it's a very similar process today. It's just a little bit cleaner than it was back in those days. In those days, the reason the word perhaps is in there is it wasn't as sure, as secure as it is today. We know if we've accepted Jesus today. If we have, then we, we know that. We know, that's a certainty. Back then, it was a perhaps. Maybe you've done enough. You know, maybe you've done enough of committing your life to God back then to be able to avoid his anger. So he's talking here, as I said, also about the period of the tribulation. And that brings us back to the question of the rapture. Is there a way to avoid the tribulation? Is there a way to get out of Dodge before the tribulation happens? It's pretty clear from this verse that there is. This is there are a lot of people that say the Old Testament never talks about the rapture. Here's an exception. Here's a verse where the Old Testament is talking about the rapture. 
Let me read that again. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness and humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. That day, we've already defined that back in chapter 1. That day is the day of the Lord, which is the tribulation. So we've already seen that that is the day of the Lord. So he's talking here. The Jews reading this in that time would have thought of it in that time. But we today realize that it's also talking about a time that is yet to come and that we can be raptured if we have sought the Lord. If we have him in our heart, we can be raptured out of this. So the Jews of Zephaniah's time who sincerely followed God's law and earnestly sought God with all their hearts and all their minds and all their souls might perhaps be saved. Um, several years later, this prophecy actually happened. So remember, he's writing this prophecy about 625 B.C., in 586 B.C., I don't have that date up here on the board, I probably should have. The dean wanted me to write something in orange, so he wrote that up there in orange. 586 B.C. is when Judah actually falls to the Babylonians. And at that point, the Jews who have accepted God and follow what Jeremiah told them to do, which is go to Babylon, will be saved. And they will, be sa they will be sheltered from what is about to happen in, uh, uh, in Jerusalem. So he told them if they wanted to be, Jeremiah told them if they wanted to be spared to leave Judah and go into captivity in Babylon. And they said, what, why would we want to do that? Right? Why don't we just run away into the desert or go to Egypt or something? Well, those Jews who did that, who ran away into the desert and went to Egypt were never heard from again. They disappeared into history. But the Jews who went to Babylon, their descendants 70 years later came back and reestablished Israel. So the people who did what God told them through Jeremiah actually prospered. And by the way, they prospered in Jeremiah. They did well. I'm sorry, they prospered in Babylon. They did well. The Jews did well financially. It's estimated that there was something like 2 million Jews in Babylon 70 years later when it was time for people to come back. So a lot of Jews did very, very well. They produced many children. They had businesses. They did so well that many of them didn't want to come back. That was a whole different problem. There were a whole lot of Jews that just stayed on in Babylon. Well, that wasn't what God wanted either. But there were a whole lot of Jews that just stayed on in Babylon because they prospered so well during that period. So that was the way out that God offered them. So similarly, God promised us in our times that if we <laughs> earnestly seek him and become committed to him, he will, perhaps, if we are earnest enough, be raptured off the earth before the tribulation begins. So that's part of this verse as well. So as I said, the, the concept of the rapture is talked about in the Old Testament. Many people think it isn't, and here's a good example of it right here in this verse. Um, let's move on to verse 4 now. I think we've kind of beat verse 3 to death this morning. In verse 4, God begins the process of telling us how bad it's going to be for the Gentile nations that hate Israel. And the rest of this chapter is about that. It's going to be pretty bad for the Gentiles if they hate Israel. We see that today. The Gentiles around the world who hate Israel are not doing well. And, you know, God, all the way back to Abraham's time in chapter 15 of Genesis, God promised Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. So that's something that's happening even in our time and that God promises us will continue. And that's what we're going to see in the rest of this chapter. In the rest of this chapter. So let's look at verse 4. Um, we're going to start, we're going to look at the four directions of Judah. We're going to look at the Philistines, which are to the east. We're going to look, or to the west, I'm sorry. We're going to look at Ammon, which is Jordan, and the Palestinians, which is to the west. Lebanon, which is Hezbollah and those guys up to the north. And we're going to look at Cush, which is Egypt, and down that way, Sudan, down to the south. So we're, this is what's going to be covered in the next several verses. We're going to look at what God has planned for each of those four groups in the future. So let's start with verse 4. Gaza will be abandoned and Ashkelon left in ruins. At midday, Ashdod will be emptied and Ekron uprooted. Now, these were four cities in Philistine, in Philistia, back in those days. Gaza, Gaza's still there today. Ashkelon, Ashkelon's still there today, although it's in Israel today. Ashdod is still there today. And Ekron, which is gone from history. 
But these were four cities that were all in this area along the coast to the south and or to the west and a little south of Judah. These are what did God just say here? It says Gaza will be abandoned and Ashkelon left in ruins. At midday, Ashdod will be emptied and Ekron uprooted. So these countries are going to be destroyed by God in the future. Uh, these were the ancient parts that were Philistines in those days. Today, we call it the Gaza Strip. It's still there today in our, in our time. The Gaza Strip is still there in that area. It's not a pleasant place today either. I know uh, my friend Pastor, Pastor Stephen visits there periodically. He said it's a pretty desperate place. The unemployment rate is beyond through the roof up there. There's... I don't know, something like a million people live in, a, in an area that's just a couple of square miles. It's just a, a desperate, desperate place today. In verse 5, God says, Woe to those who live by the sea, O Kerithite people. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. Now, the people who live by the sea is modern-day Lebanon. That was a name that the Jews had for modern-day Lebanon. In those days, they were called the Phoenicians, by the way. They lived just to the north of Israel and right on the sea. So in those days, they were called the Phoenicians or also the Kerithites is another term that we see in the Bible for them. So they were the Kerithites. Um, Canaan is a very old name. It's actually a name that goes back before Abraham's time. Canaan was a name for this whole area in here of Israel. Well, today is Israel. Uh, but Canaan was a very old name in here as well. So God is saying, Woe to you who live by the, th by the sea, O Kerithite people. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. So God is saying, Ain't going to be good for you either, guys. So God is, is going to destroy them as well. Now, that's, this has not happened yet. If the destruction of the Philistines, hasn't, the final destruction hasn't happened yet. The final destruction of Lebanon hasn't happened yet. It will happen during the tribulation period. So again, we're into the tribulation here, the day of the Lord. Verse 6, God further talks about this. He says, The land by the sea where the Kerithites dwell will be a place for shepherds and sheep pens. Now, whose shepherds and whose sheep pens? The answer is Israel's. As we go on through this, we're going to see that God is going to put Israel in charge of all this land. So this land that today is the Gaza Strip, in those days was Philistia. During the Millennial Kingdom, the period after Jesus comes back, this will be a period that will be, this will be a land that will finally be at peace. It will be a land where the, the Jews will graze their sheep in there what this verse is telling us. Their lambs and their sheep will graze in there. It will be so nice and so pastoral and so peaceful. Today it's not peaceful at all in there. Hmm. So again, the warnings about the, uh, the tribulation and the millennial kingdom. So God is talking here about how bad it's going to be during the tribulation for these people, but during the millennial kingdom the Jews will possess this land. Verse 7, God tells us, It will belong to the house of Judah, there they will find pasture. In the evening they will lie down in the houses of Ashkelon. So God is telling us that these areas, the Gaza Strip, Philistia, today, will be peaceful. The Jews will control them during the Millennial Kingdom. Remember, the Millennial Kingdom, the Jews are in a privileged position during the Millennial Kingdom. We talked about that back in my, in my Revelation class when we talked about the Millennial Kingdom. The Jews have been promised this by God for thousands of years, and they will finally get it during the Millennial Kingdom. They will get a thousand years when the entire world is at peace, and when Judah is in, and when Israel is in an, an, an elevated position, and even Jerusalem itself is up on a mountain at that time. So Israel will be in an elevated position during that period. That's not to say everybody else is going to be suffering during that period. It's, everybody else will be doing great too. But it's just to say the Jews will finally get what they've been promised all through the Old Testament. It will happen during that thousand years of the Millennial Kingdom. That's what Jesus. That's what God is talking about here, is that period of the thousand year reign when this is going to be a wonderful place. All these places that are so such so much anger and war and hate going on today in these areas and has been for thousands of years will finally be peaceful for the Jews. 
In verse 8, God now switches. Instead of looking to the east, he now switches to the west. So in verse 8, God says, I have heard the cry, the, I have heard the curses of Moab and the taunts of the Ammonites, who insulted my people and made threats against their land. Now, Moab and Ammon are over in this area here. Those are to the west of Israel. That is today what we call the West Bank. That is the Palestinian area. I'm sorry. Yes, east. Pardon me. I'm sorry. I don't know where my brain was on that one. This is east over here. <laughs> this is west. <laughs> this is north. I can tell you I never say things that I'm supposed to say differently. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we are now, we were on the, on the west over here. We have now moved to the east, and God is talking about this area. This is modern-day Jordan and modern-day West Bank. And the West Bank is the primary Palestinian area. And these guys are not fans of Israel either, not fans of the Jews either. Uh, and that's true today. It's been true since the time of Moses. So God is saying, I have heard the curses of Moab. So these people have done exactly what God told them not to do in Abraham's time. Namely, I will bless those who bless Israel, and I will curse those who curse Israel. These people are cursing Israel, so God's not going to be happy with them. These are people who curse Israel. I have heard the curses of Moab and the taunts of the Ammonites, who insulted my people and made threats against their land. So and that's still going on today. The, Philist the, the Palestinians yeah. today are still making threats against Israel and, and coveting the land of Israel. They still want the land, part of the land of Israel, or all of it, actually. So it's the modern-day West Bank and the modern-day um, area of Jordan. Uh, Jordan, most people don't realize, Jordan is actually primarily Palestinian eth ethnically. So the population of Jordan is majority Palestinian today. It's not majority Hashemite, which is what people originally thought when, when, when the British created Jordan, they thought they were creating a nation that was primarily Hashemite. They actually are uh, creating, an, uh, cre that nation today at least has evolved into a nation that is primarily Palestinian in there. Um, so, anyway, God is paying attention to these threats that people issue against Israel today. He promised back in Abraham's time that he would deal with them, and he will. So God is paying attention. All these people that are out there threatening Israel, whether they be in the Gaza Strip or in the West Bank or over in Iran or up in Hezbollah or wherever, any other place in the world, all these people that are threatening Israel and cursing Israel, God is paying attention to them, and they will be cursed. God made that, ver made that promise to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 15, way back then. Mm -hmm. Verse 9. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, surely Moab will become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a place of weeds and salt pits, a wasteland forever. The remnant of my people will plunder them forever. Hmm. Doesn't sound like the future is very good for the people that are, that are hating Israel out there, does it? They're going to be, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be gone. Their land is going to be weeds and salt and... And, uh, and horrible. So God is going to remember that and, and God will deal with that. We, sometimes we wonder, when will God deal with the evil that's going on in our world? He will. He will deal with it in his own time. Um, Deb and I went to a movie a week ago. That, I don't know, how, many, how many of you have seen the, uh, um, gosh, what was it called again? Sound of Freedom, yes. How many of you have seen Sound of Freedom? What a moving movie. If you haven't seen it, get yourself ready for it, but go see it. It's about child slavery in the world and what's going on with child slavery in the world. You look at a movie like that and you say, when is God going to deal with this kind of problem? And he will. You know, we have, as, you know, as believers, we have to believe that he will. He will deal with those kinds of things. Um, and he will deal with the people that hate Israel and that have hated Israel for thousands of years. He will. Notice how that started. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel. So he's kind of swearing by himself here. Okay, When God swears by himself, 
take that a little more seriously even than the serious stuff in the Bible, right? God is not joking about this. He is serious about this. God is going to deal with the people that hate Israel. He is going to. He's going to deal with evil in this world. He is going to. He's going to turn them into a place of weeds and salt pits, a wasteland forever, right? This is not going to be pleasant for that land, and it's going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. They're going to disappear from the earth. God is swearing on himself here. Anytime God's swearing on himself, like I said, that's pretty credible stuff. We should take that as being pretty serious as something that we can go to the bank on. Let's move on to verse 10. In verse 10, Zephaniah tells us, now in verse 10, Zephaniah is speaking now. Up until now, God's been speaking. So the who's speaking changes in verse 10. In verse 10, Zephaniah is speaking. Zephaniah tells us, this is what they will get in return for their pride, for insulting and mocking the people of the Lord Almighty. Those, so people who mock God, mock God's people who are prideful about their hatred for God who are insulting and mocking to the people of God God's going to deal with them there's going to be a special payback from God during the tribulation for them that's part of what the tribulation is all about the Jews are going to get to enjoy everything these people had during the millennial kingdom and so will the people, so will God's people who aren't the Jews, the Gentiles who've chosen him as well. Moving on to verse 11, Zephaniah tells us, the Lord will be awesome to them when he destroys all the, God, the gods of the land. The nations on every shore will worship him, everyone in his own land. So God will be just absolutely awesome as he destroys all of these peoples that hate him and that hate his people. He will be awesome with that. He's going to destroy them. He's going to destroy their gods. Their gods of the land. Anytime you see the term the land in the Bible, it's usually Bible speak for Israel. So we're talking about these false gods that people have put up in Israel. Um, the nations on every shore will worship him. Now God's broadening it out beyond Israel and talking about the entire world. So within the same verse... He's talking about what's happening in Israel, the land, and what's happening to the nations that are beyond Israel. The nations on every shore will worship him. So as we get to the millennial kingdom, God will be the only God left in the world. There will be none of these false gods anymore. They will be gone. Majesty in God will be evident to everybody as he destroys them, destroys their false gods, does all that during the tribulation. So again, this verse is talking about the tribulation. Most of what we're talking about so far about what's happening to these guys is going to happen during the tribulation. It's going to be different when we get up here to talking about Nineveh. But when we're talking about all these other people, we're talking about what's going to be happening to them during the tribulation because they opposed God and opposed God's people. Verse 12. You too, O Cushites, will be slain by my sword. So, remember, we've gone, first we went to the west with Philistia, then we went to the north with the Carathites, Lebanon, then we went to the east with Ammon and Moab, and now we're going to the south, which is Cush. Cush is an area that's called Upper Egypt. It's the upper part of the Nile, the upper meaning higher elevation, so the water flows downhill, so it's... This is southern Egypt, it's Sudan, it is Ethiopia, that area is called Cush. When you see the word Cush in the Bible, that's what it's talking about, is this area down here. So it's not going to be great for Cush either. These were the, these were the, uh, the Egyptians, the people who enslaved Israel way back when in the Bible. <coughs> you too, O Cushites, will be slain by my sword. So God's not going to forget them. Uh, they're going to be taken care of by God as well during that period. Now, in verse 13, God changes now. He switches to the north and to Assyria. And bear in mind again, at this point in time, Assyria is the enemy of Israel. It hasn't happened yet that, Israel, that Assyria has been destroyed. That will happen shortly. So in verse 13, God's, uh, Zephaniah says, He, that would be God, will stretch out his hand 
against the north and destroy Assyria, leaving Nineveh utterly desolate and as dry as the desert. Now this is the one prophecy here that is not in the tribulation period. This one is about to happen immediately. He's writing in 625 BC. This really happens right in here, just a few years later. A war starts in 615 BC. Babylon revolts against Nineveh. They fight a war for three years. Babylon wins a bunch of battles. Nineveh loses a bunch of battles. Finally, in 612 BC, they take the city of Nineveh and destroy it. And it has never been inhabited since then, which is exactly what this verse says. Isn't that interesting? So here this verse is predicting something that happened just 10 or 12 or 13 years into the future. So we go from predictions that are way out even in our future today about what's going to happen to all these other people to what's going to happen to Nineveh in just a few years in the future. It's just staggering that, 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 that God puts this kind of stuff in the Bible, that he puts these kind of prophecies in there, prophecies that are way out in the future. And in case we're wondering, gee, can I really trust that way out in the future prophecy? Well, here's a prophecy that happens, boom, a few years later, a few years from when it was made. Mm -hmm. So let's go through that one again. He will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, leaving Nineveh utterly desolate and as dry as the desert. You go to Nineveh today, it is in the desert, it is a ruin, it is dry, it is desolate. There's nothing there. No people living there today, or not many. So it happened, and it happened way back in 612 BC, just a few years after Zephaniah wrote this. So it's still that way today. It's exactly what God said in this verse would happen. That's what happened. Isn't that interesting? Imagine that. God keeps his word in the Bible. <laughs> Let's look at verse 14 next. Flocks and herds will lie down there. The creatures of every kind, the desert owl and the screech owl, will roost on her columns. Their calls will echo through the windows. The rubble will be in the doorways. The beams of cedar will be exposed. That's a scene of desolation in Nineveh. And that's what happened, and that's where it is today. It is still there today. Uh, these days you can walk through the ruins of Nineveh. I've never been there, but I understand you can walk through the ruins of Nineveh. There's not much left, but there is something left, and you can still walk through it. And Nineveh was destroyed just 13 years after Zephaniah wrote these words. Very interesting. So obviously, we know from this passage that this is God's plan. God designed this plan, but he raised up the Babylonians and the Medes was another group of people that were with the Babylonians at that time. He raised up the Babylonians and the Medes to actually execute that plan. And God does this a lot in the Bible. He has a plan to destroy something and he uses you know, evil pagans, other evil pagans to destroy a different group of, e of evil pagans. And God does that in the Bible. And he's, he's, you know, he did that here. He used the Babylonians to destroy the Assyrians. Now let's move on next to verse 15. This is the last verse of this chapter. Zephaniah tells us, This is the carefree city that lived in safety. She said to herself, I am and there is none beside me. Notice those words, I am. Right? They thought they were gods. I am. They thought they were gods. I am and there is none besides me. So, and then it goes on to say, What a ruin she has become, a lair for wild beasts. All who pass by her scoff and shake their fists. So, imagine the people living in Nineveh, right? You've got this great empire. You are the world power. In 625 BC, you are the world power. Your empire covers all of the known world that, that is you know, has any kind of education and any kind of military capability. Your empire is everywhere through here. You're sitting in the capital city, you're sitting and thinking, we're untouchable, right? We're like God, we are untouchable. We're gonna be here forever, we live in safety, nobody's ever gonna take down this country, right? Sound like anything we know? Nobody's ever gonna take down this country. <laughs> and 13 years later, it is done. Not only is that, is that country taken down, but what's left is nothing there but weeds and deserts and wild beasts are just walking through the town and 
it's just deserted. There was no, there were no people left there. There was nothing there. And people walk by and shake their fists. Yeah, and then if you got what was coming to you, right? So the people who were usurped by Nineveh, the people who were who, who were the victims of Nineveh were able to come back and say, you got your come, you know, you got what you deserved. God has finally punished you for what you did. So it happened, right? Nineveh, the people of Nineveh couldn't ever imagine that this would happen, but it did. And, you know, God willed it. It's obvious from this, these verses we just read. God willed it, and he made it happen. And it could happen to any great city or any great country of our world as well. If God wills it, it can happen. Not only that, it will happen. God may use somebody else to do it. He may use some evil organization out there or country out there to do it. But if God decides in his time that it needs to happen, then it will happen. And we, those of us living in 21st century America should be aware of that. Those living in our world today should be aware of that. If God wants to make major changes in this world, he will make them, and we're, we're not going to stand in his way. So lots of great stuff here in the Bible that we can learn about our world today. A lot, and, and, and it's in addition to learning about what happened to Judah you know, 2,600 years ago. I mean, it's easy to look at this and say, well, that was 2,600 years ago. That was Judah. Why are we studying Zephaniah? because there are messages for our world today in here as well. God is sending us messages. When we read the Bible today, we see messages that the people of 2,600 years ago in Zephaniah's time didn't see when they read the Bible, but we're seeing them today. And that's the beauty of the Bible as we study it. We just, we're constantly seeing messages that relate to our time and what's happening with us going on today. So I've actually, gosh, I'm done four minutes early. My wife is back there saying, you can't possibly be done four minutes early. <laughs> Usually I'm struggling to get the last few words in before they are. Uh, I've got time for questions, if anybody has any. Well, if you're joining us at home, thank you for tuning in. We were delighted to have you. We uh, welcome you to our class. Sorry I wasn't here last week, but I will be here for quite a while to come now before I'm gone again for anything. Um, we are, we, we are a Lifeway Wesleyan Church, and uh, you can find us on, under Lifeway Wesleyan's site on Facebook and also under Lifeway Wesleyan's site on YouTube. We are up in both of those areas. The people in class have notes today, and uh, if you want to download those notes, there's a way to do that. You can download the notes either on YouTube or on Facebook. So just click in the upper right, you'll see a thing where you can download the notes. And you'll have the same notes that people have in here. The other thing you need to study this, of course, is your Bible. So thank you, everyone, for joining us at home, and thank you, everyone here, and we will see you all next week for class number four.